it's um, a pleasure to be back in Budapest. Um, I've been several times, but it, it's been a while. Um, and in spite of all the, the, the difficulties due, uh, because of the pandemic, I'm happy that, that at least within Europe one can, one can travel again. Um, indeed, in a way, this book, um, I have written it thanks to the pandemic uh, almost, because then when Belgium went for the first time into lockdown in the spring of 2020, you know, for about a month or so, I finished uh, the, the project I was working on. And after a month, I thought, yeah, so what does one do now then? Uh, and then I thought, well, I've been thinking about this book project about Europe and the other great powers. Um, wh why don't I do that then now? And then I began to doubt again, because I think like many people, I was thinking, well, but is it still valid to, to talk about great power politics uh, and geopolitics and so on? Uh, does not the coronavirus change everything? But if you think about it, in, in international politics, it doesn't actually because it's the perfect symmetrical crisis. It hits everybody. Had it hit one of the great powers and not another, then I think it might have had a great impact. It, it would have changed the balance of power between them. But it didn't. It hit everybody. And so what you see is that the rich and the strong, they stay rich and strong, whereas the poor and the weak, they become more poor and more weak, as, as very often in, in, in a crisis. Um, and, and of course, the great powers, China, Russia, the United States, and in my view, the European Union, they are powerful enough to, to overcome the crisis, and they stay the great powers. And the balance of power between them is still the same, and it's the interaction between them that I think drives international politics in the 21st century. So I sat down and I wrote and I wrote my book. Now, to, to explain the main thesis, I want to start with a quote from my favorite author, George Orwell, from his famous book, 1984. And the quote goes, more or less, Oceania is at war with Eurasia. Therefore, Oceania has always been at war with Eurasia, because the enemy of the moment represents absolute evil. And therefore, no agreement with it is possible, neither in the past nor in the future." Unquote. Now, if you read the book, you know that this is not true. Because in the world of 1984, there are three great powers. Oceania, where Big Brother rules, um, Eurasia, but there's also East Asia. And we know that in the past, Oceania was not at war with Eurasia, but allied with Eurasia against East Asia. But the point is, it does not matter with whom it is at war as long as it is at war with at least one of the other two. Because being at war against evil legitimizes the dictatorship of Big Brother. So that war, of course, cannot be lost, but that war also, in a way, must not be won. The point of that war is that it must be everlasting. And if a war is endless, then in a way it also becomes meaningless. Now, I'm not arguing, of course, that this is the world in which we live, but I do think there are elements in in international politics today that may lead us to a rivalry without end. And if a rivalry is endless, it also becomes a bit, uh, a bit meaningless. Why do I say that? Three points that I, I want to make about this before then coming to some policy uh, prescriptions for the future. First point, we must accept that we have peer competitors. We, the European Union and the United States, um, we have peer competitors, China and, and Russia. We're not obliged to like the fact, but, but we will have to live with the fact. And I want to stress that because so often in the debate, you have an undertone of, you know, as if somehow, you know, how dare they, the Chinese, to challenge us? As if somehow normality is that we, Europeans and Americans, dominate the world. Historically speaking, that's rubbish, of course. You know, the history of world politics is a history of multipolarity. You always have multiple poles, multiple powers, who in an ever-changing game of alliances and coalitions uh, compete, but, but they also um, cooperate. And so I think it's important to understand this. You will always have peer competitors. China and Russia are not going to just disappear or crumble or just going to abandon their great power ambitions. And even if they would, then somebody else would fill the void, uh, India, Japan. So. It's important to know that because it means that the objective of our strategy cannot be to make our peer competitors disappear. Then, then, you're, then you move towards this rivalry without end. If we think that we can force our peer competitors to disappear or to abandon any global ambition, 
That's not going to happen. We have to be realistic. Um, second point, every state, every great power has legitimate interests and the right to pursue those through legitimate means, regardless of their domestic politics. Uh, China and Russia have a right to defend their territorial integrity. They have the right to defend their economic interests or to pursue the economic prosperity of their citizens through legitimate means. If they are successful at that, um, again, nobody obliges us to rejoice, but we cannot criticize them. If they play the game and they follow the rules of the game, we cannot criticize them because they play the game. They, they have as much a right to be in the game as we do. Then it's rather up to us to improve our game. Um, but we do that sometimes. Eh? Then you read in the press about some technological advantage that China has created, and then that's bad. Then it's a threat to, to world peace and, and, and human rights. Whereas if we invent something, then of course it's good. Then it's for world peace and democracy and human rights. And, and try to, you know, if you put yourself in the place of a Chinese or even an Asian Persian, that's very bizarre, as if only uh, if Europeans and Americans are the only ones who are allowed to create technological advantage. But, but even in the security sphere, um, China opened the Navy base in Djibouti 2017 in the Horn of Africa, and there was an outcry. But the US has a Navy base there, Britain, France, well, surely if they have the right to open one, so has China. We must not be happy with it. We must certainly not encourage them, but you can't criticize them for doing something that we do as well. What I want to say with that is that in my view, we need to distinguish between competition and rivalry. Competition is normal, it's an inherent part of world politics and it's inevitable. It's like in the economy. If I open a supermarket on one corner of the street and someone else opens a supermarket on the other corner of the street, we are competitors, but we are not necessarily enemies. And so it goes with states. Um, if Belgium or Hungary pursues its interest, uh, looking for export markets, for natural resources, uh, for friends and allies, it is ipso facto competing with other states that also want natural resources, export markets and so on, but it does not mean that those other states are its rivals or enemies necessarily. Plus, interests can also overlap with other states. And so, just, just as natural as competition is cooperation between states. Whereas rivalry is something else. Rivalry means that I make a conscious choice not only to pursue my interest, but to actively work against your interest, to undermine your sovereignty through, through subversion, to, to coerce you into doing or not doing something, or um, ultimately to, to attack you, to aggress you. That is rivalry. And I think we must be careful not to consider every normal act of competition as a hostile act of rivalry. Because if we do that, then again we create a self-fulfilling prophecy and we're creating a rivalry without end. Now, third point of this is that, yeah, perhaps people will say, all right, but, but surely China and Russia are dictatorships. And indeed they are. But from a point of view of grand strategy, that is frankly not the most relevant aspect. Uh, we must think here about vital interests and about what, what, our leverage, uh, what leverage we have and what leverage we don't have. The vital interest of Europe towards China and Russia is not how China treats the Chinese or how Russia treats the Russians. It's rather how China and Russia treat us in their foreign policy, not in their domestic policy. Um, it does not mean that we don't need to care about human rights in other countries. I think as, as Democrats, we do. I mean, they are human rights. They're not European rights or Hungarian or Belgian rights. They are human rights, so they are universal. And I do think we have a moral duty to criticize human rights violations whenever and wherever we see them. But I don't think we have a moral duty to try to enforce uh, human rights and, and to try to apply sanctions or even to intervene militarily because we don't have that power. Certainly not vis-a-vis -vis another great power like China or Russia. It's the same as with the Soviet Union in the Cold War. For decades, we stressed human rights. It was only in the, in the 1980s when Gorbachev came to power that there was a gradual opening up, Glasnost and Perestroika. And it will be the same now. We have to keep talking about human rights. We have to underscore the norm, 
but in the full knowledge it will be a very long-term game, and that in the short term, no matter what sanctions you apply, you cannot force China to treat the Uyghurs better, or you cannot uh, force Russia to treat, to treat its opposition any better. Meanwhile, I think we have to somehow, let's say, keep our powder dry and use effective sanctions when China and Russia or others cross the line in their foreign policy and when they do things that directly um, uh, affect our, our vital interests. Um, this is in a way uncomfortable eh? and there's still in the EU the idea that the point of EU foreign policy, the point of EU strategy is human rights. But I would say no, the point of strategy is to defend your way of life, is to defend your interests. That is what it's about. That can coincide with promotion of human rights but not always, and we must be very clear what our priorities are. I wish that I could say that the EU is going to democratize the world, but, but I would be fooling myself, and that is not very strategic. So we must be realistic, we must apply a certain degree of, of realpolitik, I would say. Which brings me to my last point, how, how does and could the EU then position itself? Well, I think in this great power game between US, Russia and China, the EU can be the mediating power. We can be the one that can work with whoever wants to work with us. And the EU codified that in a text about China, but I think it actually applies to all three of them. The EU said China is everything at the same time. It's a partner when interests coincide. It's an economic competitor, but on certain issues, it's also a rival. Uh, and we modulate our behavior according to the issue at hand and according to how China positions itself. So we don't say that China is a rival, an enemy overall. No, it depends on the issue and depends on how China behaves. As I often paraphrase it, we cooperate whenever we can, but we will push back when we must. That, I think, is conceptually the right strategy. Now, the US is, of course, mostly a partner. It's even for most of us an ally through NATO. Uh, but let's not forget it's an economic competitor. It is not the objective of US strategy to defend the European economic interests, certainly not. And it sometimes behaves even as a rival. Uh, when, when the US government applies sanctions on European firms, uh, when they do business with Iran, even though under European law that's perfectly legal, they do that to force us to change our Iran policy. For me, that's the behavior of a rival. That's not how I would expect an ally to behave. Um, and if, as sadly is possible, um, Trump or, or you know, Donald Trump or another Trump or a Trumpist would win the elections in 2024, we may see more of the same. Russia, I think, is the mirror image. Russia is mostly a rival and positions itself mostly as a rival. Although the EU keeps saying that where interest overlaps, we are still willing to work with Russia, but Russia doesn't seem to be willing to grasp that, that opportunity. And I think Russia, even though tactically it often plays a bad hand brilliantly well and with fairly limited means can create a lot of havoc in many areas around Europe, uh, and it has a lot of nuisance power, but in the end, it has maneuvered itself into a dead-end street because it has made the domestic legitimacy of the current government very dependent on this posturing, muscle flexing against Europe, which means that it can now not make a compromise with Europe even if it wanted to. Whereas Russia's real geopolitical problem is not Europe, that's China. You know, there's all of Asian Russia. Nobody lives there, so to speak, but it's full of natural resources. The other side of the border, 1.4 billion Chinese. That's a real geopolitical challenge, but they don't dare to talk about it, so they invent a problem with Europe that's much easier to talk. And we're a polite company, right? If you slap the EU in the face, we will say, did you really mean that? Are you sure you meant that? Let me invite you for lunch and we'll talk about it. You, know, you can't play those games with, with, with China. So I think Russia has maneuvered itself into a stalemate, and we have to show patience, maintain our sanctions regime that we have since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the annexation of the Crimea, until Russia is really willing to make a compromise and offer a quid pro quo. Then finally, there is, of course, China. Um, again, the EU clearly uh, partners with China where interests coincide on climate, for example. China is obviously a really big economic competitor, but that's how the economy works. Eh? We wanted China to become capitalists. Well, they are, you know, and they, they are somehow more successful uh, than us sometimes. Of course, they don't always play by the rules, and we must keep them to the rules of the game. We must stress that. They're in the World Trade Organization, they must follow the rule. 
and then we must also become more competitive. But they do also behave as a rival. For example, when they claim the entire uh, South China Sea on, on totally spurious grounds. Um, again, I so we must cooperate when we can with China, because China is not going to go away. Um, but we must push back when they cross the line. But I think we've got the emphasis wrong. It's very easy for you to get excited about Hong Kong, about the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, but we're much more timid when it comes to the de facto military annexation of the South China Sea, or when it comes to daily uh, hybrid actions against our sovereignty by China and by Russia. Then the reaction is very limited. In my view, we must turn this around. And we, we must keep talking about human rights, as I say, but we must actively push back when they cross the line in their foreign policy. And we must, I think, find a doctrine of deterrence and retaliation against all these hybrid actions against us. Spreading fake news, um, subverting our decision making, corrupting our officials, uh, sabotaging our systems, that sort of thing we must, um, I think we must show more resolve <coughs> in, um, in, in dealing with that. Then, of course, the EU is sort of principally committed to multilateralism, uh, and that's crucially important because the, the best way to, to mitigate these tensions between the great powers is still various forms of multilateral cooperation. Um, Russia doesn't care much for multilateralism, but it no longer has the power to undo the world order. China and the US are in some ways similar. They are very selective multilateralists. They follow the rules when it suits them, but they just as easily ignore the rules when that suits them. So obviously China is not a big pillar of the, of the multilateral system of the world order, but I also don't think that China, at least so far, is trying to undo the world order or somehow create an alternative system, because they're one of the great beneficiaries of the current system. Uh, but for sure, they are trying to gain more power within the system. Now, the rules of the world order as they exist, they have been written by us, Europeans and Americans, which does not make them less legitimate. You know, China and Russia have signed up to them. And we must keep them to those rules. But it's also clear that if you want to write new rules for new policy areas, yeah, they, those will not just be written in Brussels and Washington. We'll have to take into account Beijing. Because the, the challenge is precisely to maintain one world, one set of rules to which all of the great powers uh, adhere, rather than see the world split up again in two rival blocks that gradually disconnect. That would be an economic disaster, and it would make it impossible to tackle really global challenges such as the climate crisis. So I think the real challenge for the EU is to try and find you know, topics, uh, challenges, uh, interests that are shared, and on which we can cooperate, not just with the democracies, that's the easy bit, but with the non-democracies as well, and somehow pull them in and, and, and get concrete, uh, concrete solutions. One important aspect of that is connectivity also. China there has set the tone of the debate with its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, we should not be too alarmist about this. Not everything that China touches turns into gold, but we must put our own offer on the table. Huh? You, you cannot criticize countries for joining the BRI if we don't have our own offer. So we do have a lot to offer. We must sell it better and we must do more. And the US now announced its so-called global gateway. I think this is, this is very important. So to conclude, I, my argument is that Europe has, has a very crucial role to play uh, in, this, um, uh, in this world of great powers as, as the, the mediating power if you want, as the moderate power, right? Our objectives are moderate, you know? We're not going to go for world domination. No? Europeans tried that, didn't work so well. You know, been there and that. Uh, we, we, don't also, we don't even care about great power status. No EU citizen wants great power status. We just want effective governance. Our goals are moderate. We're trying to keep things together, basically. Make sure that all the great powers adhere to the same core set of rules, you know? Don't make war. Um, don't create exclusive spheres of influence, uh, maintain an open economy, treat the others as, as you would like to be treated yourself. Uh, those are moderate goals, but we must go very resolutely for those moderate goals, right? Moderation is not the same as timidity. That's maybe the mistake that we in Europe sometimes make. So what I want to say by way of conclusion is that Europe must be a power though, right? We must think of ourselves as a great power in that same league as the US, 
China and Russia. And it's still a bit uncomfortable for us because we know from European history, you know, we think oh, a power, a great power, that's someone who begins to invade neighbors, you know, or colonize continents. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. We have to be, either we're a power in that same league and we safeguard our interests, or we become a theater uh, in which the other powers' rivalries plays, play out, which is already the case. So we must be a power, which means we must show resolve, we must be united, we must show cohesion, we must, it doesn't mean everybody has to agree to everything, but, but dividing the union in the end is, is to shoot yourself in, in the foot. You may gain some short-term advantage, but in the long term, it's only as a union that we can stand up to big players like China, like Russia, and, and like the US. So voila, that's my case for Europe as a power, and I will gladly pretend to have the answer to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sven. That was a, a very, very exciting and interesting lecture. Uh, <clears throat> and I've got many questions, and I also hope that our audience will have a lot of a lot of questions. Uh, just me from the layman's layman's side. Uh, some of the questions I already wrote down, you, you more or less covered. My my first provocative question would have been that: Can Europe really uh, is Europe? Or can you really be a, a, a true power, or is it just uh, uh, something that ha used to be and still thinks that they are on the table, but the big players don't really take the, take Europe into uh, into consideration as a true and strong power? I mean, I would say in economic terms, we are a great power, undoubtedly. We're one of the three big economies with China and, and the US. What Brussels decide on economic terms has global impact. But in political and security terms, it, the, the picture is much more, uh, much more diverse. And one of the reasons is that, yeah, the, in, in the economic sphere, that's where the EU is the most in integrated, where the EU is not a state, but it's a state-like organization. It's supranational. But, but in diplomacy and security, it's the least integrated. Everything is done by unanimity by 27. So where is the center of gravity? It's not really in Brussels. But it's also no longer really in the individual capitals because even the big member states, yeah, they cannot stand by themselves vis-a-vis -vis China or the US. But, but somehow they haven't really admitted it. And so I would agree that there, let's be optimistic and say it's in the making. <laughs> And what <clears throat> I don't know. What I also wanted to ask: Do you do you directly advise uh, politicians? Uh, do, do do they take your advice? Do you have like big meetings where you sit in and they ask you? Oh, that, that's always uh, a, a tricky question to answer. I mean, sometimes when people ask ask me that, that, I say, well, the most important thing that I do is that I teach. You know, and that's the most concrete. And then otherwise, a, a think tank, because I'm so I work half time at university, half time at the uh, Egmont Institute in Brussels. So we generate ideas. And I think if an idea has some value, it will catch on, it will begin to circulate. So it rarely happens, I think, that, you know, a politician takes a decision because one or other think tanker gave him or her one specific idea. It, it's rarely such a causal. Uh, straight line, uh, but I do think yeah some of our institute's ideas circulate. The advantage of Egmont is that we're based in Brussels, and it's very easy to have regular informal conversations with people who who are in, engaged in decision making and to sort of in a very informal way, over coffee or if it's really important over lunch or dinner, um, pass on some of your ideas. Uh, there's always a lot of uh, uh, talking discussion going on about the future, how, how uh, the European U Union should look. Should it be less centralized or more centralized? Should it be uh, a, a United States of Europe or, 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 or less of that? What, what is your opinion on that? I, I'm a convinced Euro-Federalist, so I think if we want to hold our own in this world, we need to become a federation, so the United States of Europe. But it doesn't mean that you have to do everything at the EU level. Huh? Belgium is a federal state, so we don't even do everything at the, at the Belgian level. We do a lot at the Flemish, Brussels or Walloon level, and that doesn't have to change. Uh, but there are still many areas, I, I think, in which it is clear that at the national level, you can't make things happen, and, and defense is clearly one of them, and diplomacy too, for me. Uh, that, that's why I think ultimately, just like we have one currency and one foreign trade policy, we ought to have one EU diplomacy and one EU defense policy. I just put my phone here because I know if there will be any online questions, I will get it on my phone. Uh, 
there's been uh, a lot of talk about uh, a, a united European army. Uh, what's your opinion on, the, on, on that? Do you think that's a good idea? Because we, we, before we spoke and I said, oh, I, it's, uh, I, I wish we wouldn't have to talk about this. This is what I meant, that it's kind of, as a European citizen, to hear about things like that, uh, that, oh, it's, it's time to, to make a stronger European uh, uh, military. It's kind of, ooh, that's, that's not something you, you want to hear. Nevertheless, yes, we hear that there's, a, there's, a, there's an arms race going on, so yes, probably it's, it's something that, that has to be on the table. But is that something you agree with, uh, that there should be a, a, a unified European army or military? A European army in the strict sense would mean that you no longer have a Hungarian or a Belgian army, but that you have Hungarians and Belgians in uniform who are on the payroll of the EU. I mean, that, that, if you would start from zero, that would be the way to do it, right? Suppose that tomorrow you would give me 250 billion, which is what the EU27 spent on defense. You would say, defend Europe for me. Uh, I could do that, and, and I could probably, you know, put a 10% commission in my pocket, because I would make one army, right? Um, but you're not starting from scratch. We have a Belgian, a Hungarian, a British, a French army. Well, Britain's not in the EU, EU anymore, of course. So. I think where we're going is, is not to go for one EU army, but rather to create permanently integrated national armies. Now we do, there's a lot of cooperation going on, and our armed forces try to be interoperable, meaning they can cooperate with each other on operations, but it's always temporary. They get together for a specific operation, and then they split again. And what I would do is to say, you need to have national building blocks. For example, if I talk about the army, land forces, a brigade, right? A brigade can be Hungarian, can be Belgian, French, but if that Hungarian or Belgian brigade is permanently anchored in a bigger multinational core, not temporarily, but permanently, then you can do all kinds of interesting stuff. At the level of the core, you can make sure through um, division of labor or pooling of effort that, that all the capabilities that the individual countries are missing, that you have them. Heavy artillery around your, your brigades, air defense, drones, the strategic enablers, the transport aircraft, the maritime transport, the satellites, the command and control. And over time, you can harmonize the equipment that, that you use. So it will still be a Hungarian brigade in Hungarian uniform or a Belgian brigade in Belgian uniform, but it will at the same time truly be part of a single multinational unit, so that if there is a crisis, you can draw from this pool of brigades to, to create a, a, a tailor-made force for the specific operation that you want to do. That, that's how I see things uh, moving ahead. And perhaps not all 27 EU member states want to go there from the start, that's fine. But, but it only takes four or five or six um, to, to launch it, or maybe four here and four in another corner, and to really kickstart this process of integration. But we must do it, because the reality is that for 20 years we've been talking about this, but we haven't done this, we haven't done it. And the consequence is that today we have fewer military capabilities than 20 years ago. And that's not very smart, I fear. Especially that there's a really serious arms race going on, a new arms race. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussion of what uh, going around about hypersonic uh, uh, rockets. Is this something we can keep up with at all? I mean, with, with these huge uh, uh, military nations like the, the US, Russia, China, can we keep up at all with this arms race? I mean, I think we must be clear about our level of ambition. You know, we are not trying to necessarily dominate another, uh, another part of the world. We're not trying to become a military power in Asia. I think we must be able to do two things. One, to deter any aggression against the EU itself, to make it clear this would be so costly that you don't start it. Um, ultimately, there's nuclear deterrence, but I think even our conventional force may be sufficiently strong to signal to anybody that you, know, you don't want to start this. Two, we must be able to project stability into our neighborhoods, uh, our immediate neighbors towards the east and the south. That's not a purely military thing. That's also a lot of it is trade, investment, development, uh, politics, but there is a military component to that. And, and it's clear that to us, you know, the US focus has shifted. For the US, it's now clearly Asia first, and that has huge consequences. It has consequences for our own defense because it means that in a hypothetical scenario, if the US is involved in a crisis in Asia and simultaneously there's a crisis in Europe, the US might well prioritize Asia. 
meaning that we would have to defend ourselves in the first instance, holding the line until, in a later stage, probably American reinforcements will arrive. So we have to beef up our conventional defense, even if we still do it through NATO, but the European part of NATO will have to become much stronger. And secondly, we know that crises in North Africa, in the Sahel, for example, that directly affect our security, the US is not interested in dealing with them. The US wants us to deal with them. So you need your own capabilities that, are, that you're able also to move there, to project power there, to, to stabilize those countries. Now, that, that means so we, we need, we don't need the full range of, 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 of weapons that the US needs, and we don't have to follow necessarily in this race for hypersonic weapons and so on and so forth. But we do need to make sure that in, in key areas of high technology, we are there. Uh, that, that we, we have our own European capacity, that we have our defense industrial autonomy in those fields. I think maybe we can, there's, there's not many things we can thank Trump for, but I think maybe that, that is one, that, that uh, his uh, rejection from, from, from Europe kind of woke us up that we, we have to kind of uh, get on our own feet and we can't depend on the US anymore and we have to be independent from, from the States? I mean, that was clearly a shock, eh? and especially when he said during, his, during the campaign that NATO was obsolete and then he retracted that, but only up to, an, uh, to a degree. And he kept saying that, yeah, if you don't pay your dues, you know, I'm not sure now we will defend you. And, and it was a shock. And yet, you see that many member states still don't want to see the reality. And, and I understand that. I understand the temptation that, you know, if you convince yourself that no matter what, in the end, the U.S. cavalry is going to come to save you, then suddenly nothing is urgent anymore, right? Then, then yeah, then we can pack up now and go for dinner. Um, um, and so I understand that temptation, but I think it's very short-sighted to think that whatever happens, the U.S. cavalry will be there. Perhaps. Perhaps not. It depends on what the U.S. cavalry happens to be doing at a particular moment in time. And if you go to Washington, if you speak with American strategic thinkers, it's very, very clear. Their number one priority is, is Asia. And that's, that's, that's structural. It's Obama who launched that. Um, and it's the first time since the Second World War that it's Asia first. Because when America entered the Second World War, 1941, it was Europe first. You know, they were, defeat Nazi Germany first before they would turn on Japan. And then during the Cold War, the, the, the Cold War became a hot war pretty much everywhere but in Europe. But the point was always control of Europe, right? And, and the, the, the nodal point was Berlin. And, and the Americans in the end could abandon Saigon, right, which became Ho Chi Minh City, but Berlin could not become Khrushchev City, right? And that was the point. And now for the very first time, that has changed. I think we Europeans must really adapt to that. It means that the Americans now no longer look upon us as allies to be protected. They, they rather look upon us as allies that have to help them against China. And so we have to make up our mind, well, what is our interest in this? What is our position in that? And probably it means we should not blindly follow the Americans in everything. Uh, you've talked about uh, this this new power pattern of of uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, the States, and hopefully uh, Europe. Uh, do you think there is a chance that this this pattern may may change? Uh, one of the like the the influence of the U.S. shrinks that much that 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 somebody can grow over uh, and and fill that vacuum. Mm, I think. For all of those four players, the, the biggest threat to their great power status is internal. Um, uh, I, I would refer to the storming of the US Capitol by Trump supporters earlier this year. Had that succeeded and had that led to more, they could have really disrupted the American democracy, the American political system. And that's a, a massive, I mean, I, I would really not underestimate it. That's a huge internal threat to the US. It's that sort of thing that could really make the U.S. suddenly lose a lot of power, uh, I think. Just like within Europe, it's, it, it's the anti-democrats that I think are the greatest threat to, to the power of Europe. Because the power of Europe lies in its, its cohesion. It's the size of our single market. That's the source of our power. But if you disrupt that single market, then, then you, you destroy that power in, in, in very short term. So I would say the main threat is always internal. 
in places like Russia and China, it's mostly the succession, right? In an authoritarian system, the question is always, can you peacefully regulate the succession? You know? What happens when President Putin passes away? Who is next? Nobody knows, or at least I don't know. I'm not going to ask me, but you know, is there somebody ready? Will there be a succession crisis? Will there be a fight? There could be a prolonged period of instability. In China now, because Xi Jinping, had, they had a system, you know, do two terms and then, you know, during your second term, the next one is prepared. Xi Jinping has now broken the system by asking for a third term. So that has also created some instability. So I think it's these internal factors that are most likely to, to disrupt the balance of power. And then we get to, I think, for me at least, the, the most important question that you have uh, touched upon is is uh, climate crisis. So we're talking about all these strategic political uh, uh, scenarios, but here's something that might uh, affect and probably will affect everybody equally. Uh, do you think that maybe we can put aside all this r uh, rivalry and concentrate on this one task? It, it, it's a question I often ask myself also, but in a way I've written a very old-fashioned book, you know. This book is not about climate, it's not about artificial intelligence, it's not, not, not too much about cyber. It's about good old-fashioned great power politics, geopolitics and strategy. But it remains important um, because, of course, absolutely right, the climate crisis is a, is, a, is a lethal, it's a mortal challenge and it affects all of us. And in the, if we don't solve it, none of the rest will matter. That is clear, right? Um, but at the same time, while we are trying to solve it, it's also very important that we don't kill each other first in a great power war. And also, if you would find the solution to the climate crisis, it cannot be implemented if you do not get all of the great powers on board, right? There's nothing you can do if China is not on board or if the US is not on board. So I do think great power politics remains massively relevant even in this age. Now, I think China actually will become ever more serious about climate, if only because of domestic politics, because the regime knows that, yeah, if you cannot walk around in, in Beijing because the air is too bad, in the end it will create too much unrest. Um, and that will threaten their legitimacy and their power base, because China is not just based on repression. The regime also tries to say to be a, a responsible government that cares about uh, security and safety of citizens. Um, the big question for me is, is, is Russia, because so much of Russia's power is based on export of fossil fuels and weapons. Um, but as the other states go for the green transition, um, if Russia does not catch up, what will happen to its power base? And so I think there is a threat to Russia. And the US, the, the picture is strangely mixed because in the US it has become so politicized, the climate uh, policy, so that now under Biden, you know, they're trying to ramp up. Uh, but Trump did a lot. Uh, Trump left the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Protocol, then Biden rejoined. But everybody knows that if next time uh, the Republicans win again, they might again undo this. And this is very difficult for, for the rest of the world to deal with. You know, the, the US is, is uh, not really playing a leading role because of its domestic division here. Uh, you've mentioned Russia and its and its uh, power uh, lying in in fossil fuels. Do you think that this 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 uh, gas uh, crisis that we are living through right now, uh, not not enough gas coming from from Russia? Do you think this might be a strategic move from from Putin to show that you know don't mess don't mess with it because you still rely heavily on on our gas? I, I would not be surprised about that, and, and of course, there's also the the financial element driving up the price. At the same time, I, I am convinced that Russia cannot push this too far because the dependence works both ways. You know, We need to import, but they need to export. It is the state revenue. And you know that if, you, if, if, if your customers are no longer convinced that you're a reliable supplier, you will push them away. This will take time. You cannot just switch, you know, and we cannot now do without Russian gas. Um, but everybody knows we will diversify more. And especially we will transition to more green energy. So I, I think they cannot um, overplay this. And you saw now that when, when the president of, of Belarus uh, tried to also threaten this, that actually he got 
uh, got slapped on the fingers by, by Russia. So that, that seems to indicate that they know that it, it, it's hard to say the gas trade or the energy trade, it can be weaponized, but up to a point. It's a weapon that you cannot use too often or you, you nullify its effect, I think. Uh, I've got one kind of hippie question for, 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 for the end. Uh, can you vision, envision a, a world where there is no uh, big power uh, rivalry and strategy and, and, and humanity uh, comes together in a, in a big happy family without any kind of rivalry and war? I, I think what we can still hope for now is, I mean, there will remain separate great powers and they will have different models uh, and also because their, their history is different and they will not so easily converge to one type of society, I think. But what we can hope for in my view is a sort of a concert of powers. And we had an, a concert of the European powers in the 19th century, but it's a bit different in the sense of course it would be multinational, China, Russia, Europe, America. Um, but it would not just be the great powers, it would be a concert of powers, but embedded within strong multilateral institutions so that they would lead, but within those institutions, meaning with the other member states, rather than just dictating to the other states. They would, they would do it through those multilateral institutions. I think that's still something that you can hope for. If, if the great powers are convinced that they have more of an interest in cooperating on a core set of rules rather than undermining the rules. And, and I think to a large extent, this is certainly still the case for China, the US and, and, and the EU, somewhat less for Russia, because they all um, seek um, global trade. You know, and we really have integrated interdependent economies. That doesn't guarantee anything. Eh? There were lots of arguments before the First World War that said, oh, economic integration makes war impossible. Then, you know, Franz Ferdinand was shot and there, you were, there we were. But it is an obstacle to, to real war. It, it does act as a break on, on escalation of, of tensions. And so I think as long as we think that this concert of powers, that cooperation is still possible, we should really try to, to, to make that, you know. Um, I end the book by saying predicting war is easy, right? And sort of doom, uh, doom saying, um, you don't predict peace, you build it. And, and I think that's the duty of the EU still. Wonderful, wonderful uh, words, for final words. Uh, Maybe, but maybe not. Maybe we have some questions from the audience. Van esetleg kérdése valakinek? You have mentioned that you are an old-fashioned, able thinking <laughs> man. But I am I'm curious. I, I am interested for the alternative ways of war. So where is Europe's rule in this question? So artificial intelligence, electronic war, fake news, etc. So, so if we hear news, they are between, let me say, Israel and Iran, US, Russia. But I didn't hear too much about European method of, uh, yeah. True, um, and thank you for that question. I mean, one thing is that all these new forms of warfare they never replace the old forms. They are added to them. But the old forms still continue, right? It's like, it's like after World War I when we invented air power, then you had some theories that say, oh, future wars will only be fought from the air. Well, no. And it's just like today, <coughs> no war will only be fought in cyber, in cyberspace. Wars will also still be fought at the same time in the physical space. But you must be... Uh, capable in all dimensions. So we must add the cybersphere to it and, and this whole what we now call um, a hybrid sphere. So uh, that's why we must also have our own capacity in this field and we must make sure that we are ourselves at, at the forefront of technology and, and research and technology in, in artificial intelligence for example, in quantum computing also. Um, because if you're not if you are, then you can try to regulate it, because the EU always tries to regulate, for example, artificial intelligence. But my fear is that if you're not yourself at the forefront of technology and production, who will care about your rules? So if you want to be able to regulate, you have to be a producer, that's why I think. Now, at the same time, um, what I think we miss is a sort of a kind of doctrine of, of deterrence against all these kind of actions against us. Um, we do build up defenses, so we say we build up cyber walls and so on and so forth, 
but, but we don't really react so much. So we do what is called um, deterrence by denial, building up strong defense, but we don't do deterrence by punishment, by retaliation. I think we have to consider that, that when, when other states really go too far, that we must strike back. That can be with diplomatic sanctions, can be economic sanctions, but it could also be by a cyber counterattack. So I do think you need this kind of um, capacity too, in order to deter this kind of action um, against us. And I think, frankly, we can only have that kind of capacity at the European level. I, I think it's beyond the means of, of indiv individual states now. The, the EU is beginning to think about this in, in, in new strategic thinking about deterring, deterring uh, hybrid uh, actions, about its own cyber defense doctrine and so on and so forth. So beginning to think about it, but we're already behind, so we, we should probably accelerate this to, to take up the urgency of your question. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so my personal opinion is that to, to have a nuclear war, it, it costs too much so in consequences, in money, etc. But to make an electronic war, it's easy. And uh, I am an old man, so I remember that about 40 years ago, or 60, 50, in New York was an uh, electrical, so missing, so electricity went out. And the prisons were open, so the New York died for two days. Today, we are much more depending on electricity, so uh, electronic. So if my computer does not work three days, so I am lost. But uh, so, so we have heard some news that Russia and Estonia, so they blocked two days or some, sometimes the governmental uh, offices. And I don't see any, any instructions or possibilities. So if we get some attack in the electronics, then what should we do? I think that not only in Hungary, but uh, I don't see the aspiration in Europe. Yo, okay, so that's it. No, no, I agree. I, I agree that we really must develop a sort of doctrine on this and, and the capacity. Um, and as I said, it is in the debate now, but we're already, we're already behind this. Um, and I mean, some stuff is happening on a daily basis, but it stays below a certain threshold also. But you're right to say that if you go all out in this kind of cyber attack, you could paralyze the functioning of a society. And at one point, the state that is the victim of it could decide, well, now we consider it an act of war. And once you say it's an act of war, then you can also decide to retaliate by military means. We're not there, but but that could be the as consequence. As long as you can identify who the at attacker is. Yeah, no, and that there's certainly that. Although, I mean, you hear mixed messages about this from, from cyber experts. Um, but you could also, I mean, part of the deterrent is also to say, well, if we are sufficiently sure, uh, we will strike back. So that's ambiguity is also part of the deterrence, I think. We had another question from the back row. Yes, actually, you partly already answered, but perhaps you might add a few more things about it. what I was going to ask. That if you said somehow ironically that if someone is slapping the EU in the face, then we invite the other half for, for dinner. Um, but what what else do you think we could do? What other assets the European Union ha have? Uh, just listed a few, but if you can add a few more things, that would be great. Well, uh, our, our fortune is that, that the core of our positioning vis-a-vis -vis the other powers is our economy. And, and in the economic sphere, we are the most integrated. And now, every, now we talk about geoeconomics, basically the strategic use of, of economic instruments. Uh, and there the Commission can do a lot because a lot of the competences are already have been Europeanized or are supranational. Uh, and so... For us to regulate who can do what on our market, that's a really important uh, tool of, of power. And I think there we have really become conscious of that, that it's, this is not just about our economic objectives and interests, but about our overall grand strategic objective and interest, that you must get this right. 
um, and, and things are moving. So we have investment screening, for example, to be able to defend our sovereignty. But you can also play with market access to try and influence others' um, others' behavior. So I would say this is the core still of of, of power. And as long as um, the other great powers don't turn to open war, then I think geoeconomics will stay the core of it. And so it's really important uh, that we do this for ourselves, but also, as I stress, that we make an offer to the rest of the world. And so I, I do think this global gateway, and then EU investment in, in connectivity, in, in roads, railroads, uh, airports, seaports, uh, cyber connectivity, energy connectivity, with the rest of the world, I think it's really important that we put an offer on the table. Uh, and I think what we will see then is that countries will, that you will see a pendulum movement. And now lots of countries, they, they want to try the Chinese offer because it's still relatively new. Um, but some of them already see the drawbacks of it. And if there's an also a good European offer on the table, because most states don't want to choose sides. Most third states just want to have good relations with all powers. Um, and so if we put a good offer on the table, they will also work, uh, work with us. I think that's really, really important. Now, a bit counterintuitive perhaps, but China is present everywhere in the world. But there's one thing that China is still reluctant to do, that's to offer military assistance. We can do that, not in Asia, but in Africa, we can do that. It's, of course, a very sensitive instrument. But if a state seeks military assistance, it will not turn to China. The Chinese will not give it. They maybe export some weapons. They can invite some officers to do the staff course in Beijing. But to say, you know, we need a brigade to fight terrorism on our soil, you know, France does it in Mali. The Chinese will never do that. Uh, so that's something that we can put on the table that China cannot. Russia plays with this, of course, and where we are not, then the Russians become active, but more to, for the sake of the nuisance power of it, more to create a distraction, because if we are dealing with Russians in the Central African Republic and Russians in Libya, then in the mind of Moscow, we're not dealing with Ukraine. Uh, and, and, and think they do it from, from that kind of view. So it, 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 I know it's very sensitive, and I'm not an interventionist, but we should have the minimum military presence, especially on our southern flank, uh, to maintain influence. And, and it's something that is in demand and that we can offer. So let, let's, let's use it.